and yet there it is in front of us and to me it was a great matter that both my literary work and my zest for learning should be known by that man for if he approved them i would be even more fond of him but if he disapproved this vain heart of mine devoid of thy steadfastness would have been offended and so i meditated on the problem of the beautiful and the fitting and dedicated my essay on it to him i regarded it admiringly though no one else joined me in doing so chapter fifteen but i had not seen how the main point in these great issues lie really in thy craftsmanship o omnipotent one who alone doest great wonders and so my mind ranged through the corporeal forms and I defined and distinguished as beautiful that which is so in itself, and as fit that which is beautiful in relation to some other thing. This argument I supported by corporeal examples. And I turned my attention to the nature of the mind, but the false opinions which I held concerning spiritual things prevented me from seeing the truth. Still, the very power of truth forced itself onto my gaze and I turned my throbbing soul away from the incorporeal substance to qualities of line and colour and shape, and because I could not perceive these with my mind, I concluded that I could not perceive my mind. And since I loved the peace which is in virtue, and hated the discord which is in vice, I distinguished between the unity there is in virtue, and the discord there is in vice. I conceived that unity consisted of the rational soul and the nature of truth and the highest good. But I imagined that in the disunity there was some kind of substance of irrational life and some kind of entity in the supreme evil. This evil, I thought, was not only a substance but real life as well. And yet I believed that it did not come from thee, O my God, from whom there are all things. And the first I called a monad, as if it were a soul without sex. The other I called a dyad, which showed itself in anger, in deeds of violence, in deeds of passion and lust. But I did not know what I was talking about, for I had not understood, nor had I been taught, that evil is not a substance at all, and that our soul is not that supreme and unchangeable good. For just as in violence acts, if the emotion of the soul from whence the violent impulse springs is depraved and asserts itself insolently and mutinously and just as in the acts of passion if the affection of the soul which gives rise to the carnal desires is unrestrained so also in the same way errors and false opinions contaminate life if the rational soul itself is depraved thus it was then with me for I was ignorant that my soul had to be enlightened by another light, if it was to be partaker of the truth, since it is not itself the essence of truth. For thou wilt light my lamp, the Lord my God will lighten the darkness, and of his fullness have we all received, for that was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, for in thee there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But I pushed on toward thee, and was pressed back by thee, that I might know the taste of death, for thou resistest the proud. And what greater pride could there be for me than with a marvellous madness to assert myself to be that nature which thou art? I was mutable. This much was clear enough to me because my very longing to become wise arose out of a wish to change from worse to better. Yet I chose rather to think thee mutable than to think that I was not as thou art. For this reason I was thrust back. Thou didst resist my fickle pride. Thus I went on imagining corporeal forms, and since I was flesh I accused the flesh, and since I was a wind that passes away, I did not return to thee, but went wandering and wandering on toward those things that have no being, neither in thee, nor in me, nor in the body. These fancies were not created for me by thy truth, but conceived by my own vain conceit out of sensory notions. 
and I used to ask thy faithful children, my own fellow citizens from whom I stood unconsciously exiled, I used flippantly and foolishly to ask them, Why then does the soul which God created err? But I would not allow anyone to ask me, Why then does God err? I preferred to contend that thy immutable substance was involved in error through necessity, rather than admit that my own mutable substance had gone astray of its own free will and had fallen into error as its punishment. I was about twenty-six or twenty-seven when I wrote these books, analysing and reflecting upon those sensory images which clamoured in the ears of my heart. I was straining those ears to hear thy inward melody, O sweet truth, pondering on the beautiful and the fitting, and longing to stay and hear thee, and to rejoice greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Yet I could not, for by the clamour of my own errors I was hurried outside myself, and by the weight of my own pride I was sinking ever lower. You did not make me to hear joy and gladness, nor did the bones rejoice which were not yet humbled. And what did it profit me, that when I was scarcely twenty years old, a book of Aristotle's entitled The Ten Categories fell into my hands? On the very title of this I hung as on something great and divine, since my rhetoric master at Carthage and others who had reputations for learning were always referring to it with such swelling pride. I read it by myself and understood it. And what did it mean that when I discussed it with others they said that even with the assistance of tutors, who not only explained it orally but drew many diagrams in the sand, they scarcely understood it and could tell me no more about it than I had acquired in the reading of it by myself alone? For the book appeared to me to speak plainly enough about substances such as man, and of their qualities, such as the shape of a man, his kind, his stature, how many feet high, and his family relationship, his status, when born, whether he is sitting or standing, is shod or armed, or is doing something or having something done to him, and all the innumerable things that are classified under these nine categories, of which I have given some examples, or under the chief category of substance. What did all this profit me, since it actually hindered me when I imagined that whatever existed was comprehended within those ten categories? I tried to interpret them, O oh my God, so that even thy wonderful and unchangeable unity could be understood as subjected to thy own magnitude or beauty, as if they existed in thee as their subject, as they do in corporeal bodies, whereas thou art thyself thy own magnitude and beauty. A body is not great or fair because it is a body, because even if it were less great or less beautiful, it would still be a body. But my conception of thee was falsity, not truth. It was a figment of my own misery, not the stable ground of thy blessedness. For thou hast commanded, and it was carried out in me, that the earth should bring forth briars and thorns for me, and that with heavy labour I should gain my bread. And what did it profit me that I could read and understand for myself all the books I could get in the so-called liberal arts when I was actually a worthless slave of wicked lust? I took delight in them, not knowing the real source of what it was in them that was true and certain. For I had my back toward the light and my face toward the things on which the light falls so that my face which looked toward the illuminated things, was not itself illuminated. Whatever was written in any of the fields of rhetoric or logic, geometry, music or arithmetic, I could understand without any great difficulty and without the instruction of another man. All this thou knowest, O Lord my God, because both quickness in understanding and acuteness in insight are thy gifts. Yet for such gift, I made no thank-offering to thee. Therefore my abilities served not my profit, but rather my loss, since I went about trying to bring so large a part of my substance into my own power. And I did not store up my strength for thee, 
but went away from thee into the far country to prostitute my gifts in disordered appetite. And what did these abilities profit me if I did not put them to good use? I did not realize that those arts were understood with great difficulty, even by the studious and the intelligent, until I tried to explain them to others and discover that even the most proficient in them followed my explanations all too slowly. And yet, what did this profit me? Since I still supposed that thou, O Lord God, the truth, wert a bright and vast body, and that I was a particle of that body. O oh, perversity gone too far! But so it was with me. And I do not blush, O oh my God, to confess thy mercies to me in thy presence, or to call upon thee, any more than I did not blush when I openly avowed my blasphemies before men, and bade hound-like against thee. What good was it for me that my nimble wit could run through those studies and disentangle all those knotty volumes without help from a human teacher, since all the while I was erring so hatefully and with such sacrilege as far as the right substance of pious faith was concerned? And what kind of burden was it for thy little ones to have a far slower wit, since they did not use it to depart from thee, and since they remained in the nest of thy church to become safely fledged and to nourish the wings of love by the food of a sound faith? O Lord our God, under the shadow of thy wings let us hope, defend us and support us. Thou wilt bear us up when we are little, and even down to our grey hairs thou wilt carry us. For our stability, when it is in thee, is stability indeed. But when it is in ourselves, then it is all unstable. Our good lives forever with thee, and when we turn from thee with aversion, we fall into our own perversion. Let us now, O Lord, return that we be not overturned, because with thee our good lives without blemish, for our good is thee thyself. And we need not fear that we shall find no place to return to because we fell away from it. For in our absence our home, which is thy eternity, does not fall away. End of Book Four